Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Christopher Mullen talks with Ross Clark about his new book, Technical Trading Mastery. It's a real world lesson. Eric Coffin, editor of the Hard Rock Advisory Newsletter on the future of commodities. Ross Clark talks to Christopher Mullen right after this. More and more people are looking to the internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604 699 8600. 604 699 8600. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Sitting in for Phil Mackesy, here is Jim Goddard. My guest is CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark, who interviews Chris Vermeulen about his new book, Technical Trading Mastery. And uh, as a technician myself, I'm always interested in uh, what others are doing and uh, just how they've been uh, incorporating technical analysis into their trading, uh, how they view it from a uh, perspective of uh, the, the psychology of the trader, understanding themselves. And I think uh, Chris here has done just a, a very, very good job uh, in the uh, book that he has out right now. And uh, we uh, are very happy to have you, Chris. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, looking at your book, you know, you, you start off, I think, with what is probably more important than anything else, and that's the whole psychology of the, the trader and the investor. Uh, right. And, you know, take a while to get around to the, 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 the technicals of how do you trade, how do you make money. And I think maybe if you could just go through the um, sort of the thought process that people should have on the psychology and knowing themselves uh, and um, some of the things you might have uh, addressed there. Yeah, well, again, just like you said there, one of the most important parts of trading is is understanding uh, really who you are and your your mindset, your personality, your available time frame, and what you believe, your beliefs in the, in the, in the financial markets of how they move and why they move. Everybody's got a totally different outlook, and everybody trades in a totally different way. And some people, you know, like to trade certain investments or, or certain time frames because that's just the way their brain processes it. Others like to step back and take a bigger, more fundamental look. And what it, what the first couple of sections of the book does is it, it kind of just walks you through a simple format that it makes you question yourself. How do you see this? How do you see that? How do you perceive the market? And there's a, there's a short quiz in there that you can kind of fill out an answer. And when you're done, you end up with your own um, more or less beliefs of the system of, of the market and and from there, you can you build your base on how you want to trade and what you need to focus on going forward. Because a lot of people just get caught up in the emotion side of trading, trying to you know buy low, sell high, and it's, the market really is doesn't really work that way. It's, you'll end up doing the complete opposite. So yep. the book always the book really focuses on you understanding the risk levels and understanding um, if you want to if you want to take a technical aspect or a fundamental aspect or try and do like a hybrid of both. Um, in this book, I kind of really narrow down. I just focus on the technical side of things because in the grand scheme of things, the only thing that makes you money in the stock market or any market is when price moves in your favor. It doesn't matter what the headline news are. It doesn't matter if the fundamentals are going the opposite way as what you know the stock price is going. The only thing that pays is price. So that is what my focus is. It's always been my focus is technical analysis, focus on supply and demand. Well, it gets into that whole concept that the, the market is the sum of the knowledge of everyone that's uh, that's in there, and uh, some of the, you know, and anyone who has a, a deep background on the fundamentals uh, will, at various times, find themselves totally out of sync with what the market is doing because it does manage to remain uh, irrational as uh, for extended periods of time. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I, I, from the technical perspective, uh, I love the uh, you know the initial sort of overview that you have with it, that there are four stages, both in terms of price activity and also in terms of the emotions of the traders, etc. Um, I, I see uh, that uh, uh, Stan Weinstein is uh, you, you use his technique for that, of which, uh, gosh, this, this brings back memories to me because the very first market letters that I ever read were from Richard Russell, his Dow Theory, and Justin yeah. Justin Mamus, who was 
the um, one that uh, Stan used uh, learned his material from uh, for a PTR back in the 1970s. So right, this, yeah. this goes full cycle as far as I'm concerned, and the, the whole business of finding bases, finding tops, then looking for volume confirmations um, on the initial moves. Yeah, it really is basic technical analysis. That is, that's the that's that's the whole point of of it, to me technical analysis is just find the trend if there is a trend going up or down, and then try and maximize it and use volume to kind of help you uh, show that there's commitment behind it. But you don't always need volume behind it. But that's the main thing is those four stages. They just kind of they're the foundation. If you if you cannot identify when something is kind of trendless and to avoid it you know, you're way better to focus on some other investments. When something is trending up or down, you can get on on the bandwagon and uh, and do your trades. Yeah. Now, I know you use cycles. Um, you've got everything from the longer term, so those 11 to 14 or 7-year type of cycles all the way down to uh, daily momentum signals. And I would assume that you're using those to then help you determine – uh, if you're coming to the end of trends, because you know, buying or selling uh, retracements within trends works great until you get to the end of the move. And then always that last buy on the pullback is your worst trade. <laughs> exactly. And that's how it is. If for any trend trading strategy, you're always going to get nailed when the trend reverses. And usually it's, you know, it's a, you get nailed pretty good because it's just the way trading the trend does. And, and cycles allow you to minimize and a lot of times avoid getting caught on the wrong side with that last trade taking a big hit and as a longer term cycle is finally starting to top and, and, and start to pull back and it's putting downward pressure you realize you know all the rallies are starting to fade and die out a little early you start to see you can see the shift happening and you actually can start to see it usually in volume flow and um, it, do, it does allow you to trim your positions back tighten your stops if you have any new pullbacks that you would normally get into, you can step back and say, "Okay, I'm going to take a much smaller position, or I'm going to I'm going to maybe actually wait and, and and pass on this for now and focus on some other investment because this one, this cycle, everything is fizzling out from the looks of it." Yeah, and that that's what I really like about the cycle analysis is you can apply to different time frames and you can apply multiple cycles. And, and and really do help time these trend rever- potential trend reversals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you say for and for each uh, investor, they will have a different fr- time frame that that they are comfortable with. I mean, I, I know people who have trouble holding a position overnight, and yet other people who, you know, basically the newspaper is uh, they're they're happy enough with the day old news uh, when it comes to the investment side. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the things, too, is as markets um, become exponential in their moves, um, you know, whether it be up or, I guess, in particular to the downside, um, you know, human nature just really, really sets in. And, and that, I think, is, you know, one of the keys for your type of work where you start to recognize that you might be coming to the tail end of a move. Because is, it, is that not a more predictable area, actually, of the marketplace? Yeah, are you saying when the market is selling off? Oh, yeah, when the fear and greed really set in. Yeah, I find fear is the is the ultimate roller coaster. Fear is is much more profitable in my position, in my opinion. I I would love to trade short all the time and play things that are falling in price. A lot harder to do, and I don't really do it too much in a full out bull market. But when price is falling and fear is set in, and people are in panic mode. There, it's really predictable, and, and you have to trade a down market much more aggressive and much more active than an uptrend. But I'll tell you, you know, you can you can see fear clear as daylight on the charts uh, when you're watching the proper indicators and volume and everything else. Um, and it is much easier to time than it is uh, greed. Greed can drag out the markets have a tendency of climbing and rising and grinding higher, but fear is usually. A little bit more of an event than uh, than a process like a top is. Well, and, and uh, those bull markets can take years to resolve themselves on the upside. However, uh, the bear market moves tend to be just a fraction of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, uh, in terms of measuring that uh, the fear and greed, um, I guess the, the the classic index is VIX. 
and um, I see that you know you you like to use that in particular for the uh, the S and P, which um, I gather is uh, the forte to one of your uh, um, algo programs that you work with. It is, yeah. I like I like using volatility in, in the VIX, and when it reaches certain levels, it, it, it changes my my um, trade strategy and my money management a bit. Usually, as the volatility climbs, uh, position sizes get a little bit smaller because we know things can have a knee-jerk reaction in, in either direction. So I like to use the VIX for helping time, you know, some um, market bottoms and market tops. But really, the, the VIX itself, to me, uh, really just helps identify uh, how much money we should be putting at risk. As the VIX climbs, again, reducing position size, and uh, usually you're, you'll be trading short as the VIX is rising. So you're making money as it's falling quicker, uh, the, the market's falling quicker, but you've got smaller positions just because it's, it's a little more dangerous uh, on the downside when the markets are, when yeah. volatility is high. Right. Now, I started in an era where uh, we hadn't seen the VIX above 20 until the crash in 87. And now, I mean, 20 is not a special number at all. Um, yeah. Your work, uh, rather than looking at absolute levels for VIX, uh, you know, I mean, uh, as I say, um, the volatility has expanded significantly in the last uh, 10 years. Um, I'm, from what I can see in your material, you are um, uh, using different bands around the volatility to adjust for that. So I would assume <clears throat> that uh, given what we had had 20 years ago versus what we have today, that uh, the system is uh, – adjusting in a um, uh, just a, a regular reasonable manner uh, around these uh, changes would that be accurate yeah using using like Bollinger bands you can get a good feeling of what's going on with volatility in uh, not even just on the VIX but on the actual underlying investment you're trading and and you know you know how kind of volatility and, and uh, standard deviation works you know 95 percent of the price action is going to fall within two standard deviations and you know, you can, you can use simple numbers like that to get a real feel for volatility. And, of course, the bands expand and contract with the market. So I, I, I really do like to use Bollinger Bands a lot because you can catch these short-term extremes in the market. When, when the market is stretched a little bit too far one way, there's a great chance it's going to come back to the center or even go beyond. And you can catch these repeated, more or less, uh, cycles in the market over and over again as uh, it times itself out with uh, trends and, and support levels and uh, moving averages, things like that. More with Ross Clark and Christopher Mullen next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. More with CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark's interview with Chris Vermeulen about his book, Technical Trading Mastery. Okay, when we get into the black swans of 2008 or 1998 or 1987, and you're, you're punching out broadly beyond the, uh, the normal bands there, um, and uh, the, um, even though Nobel uh, laureates uh, had troubles in those markets, um, do you, does your system basically just um, wind down, stop trading, or do you still try and deal with those uh, uh, large percentage moves such as that? Uh, the system winds down to do minimum position sizes when, when the market goes AWOL, but um, more or less, if it, it's always trying to trade with the trend, and as long as we're trading with the trend, and there is, you know, and the market has rolled over, say going to the downside, it's going to actively trade the downside. It doesn't matter what the volatility is. If, as volatility picks up, you know, the market has to reach a lot more in order to find a new shorting opportunity, and then you know it'll continue to move in your favor. So it is constantly going to be trading all those opportunities, uh, it, it, and it usually falls in favor with our positions because we're trading with the trend. So as long as we stick with the trend then, you know, the odds are we're going to be moving and catching plays within the move. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, because we know, you know, clearly that's when the best opportunities arise after you've had the big volatility, you know, rather than, you know, we all know you can't surf in a, in a calm sea, and if uh, the markets are in really tight trading ranges, there there usually aren't that many uh, opportunities in there. So uh, for what you're doing is uh, uh, I, you, you talk about the S&P. Um, what other markets um, do you um, offer to people um, as far as, you know, whether it be in the financial futures or uh, the derivative products or ETFs? Yeah, I, I, co- I cover pretty much the, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the SP 500. Uh, the strategy that I run uh, runs on all those uh, Indexes and of course it, it can be applied to ETFs. You can trade options around it. You can trade the futures, which is my what I like to trade. Uh, you can trade options on the futures or on the ETFs. If you want to get real fancy, you can actually go search out high beta stocks. So when we get like a buy signal in the say the SP 500, you can go out and buy a high beta stock, and you know the SP 500 rises one and a half percent, but your high beta stock jumps five percent. So there's all kinds of different angles you can play it. And, you know, you want to kind of branch out and, and cover, have a basket of different types of plays and, and focus on stocks that are in hot sectors. Money's been moving in. They've got good relative strength. And when you put all these things together, you end up with a really strong portfolio of stocks and, and commodities like gold and, and natural gas, things like that. They, you know, are all moving in favor with their current trends and you're buying them usually within a pullback within the trend and, and things moving your, in your favor pretty quickly, usually within four or five days, we're within, uh, you know, back in the money because usually you can't pick a dead bottom, obviously, but because we're using multiple cycles and, and key support levels when we're kind of cherry picking these plays, they, they naturally have a tendency to pop back into our favor quickly. Right, right. Um, you know, I, I tend to use uh, three different time frames. I'll use daily, weekly, and monthly with various signals rather than the cyclic approach. But um, I think, you know, they both have their pros and cons on them. But, uh, yeah, the, the multiple cycles, uh, when, when they do come into play, it's, it's very, very nice when you're getting uh, a series of them peaking or uh, troughing out. Yeah, exactly. And, and for, for example, the, my main strategy, I focus on the daily the 30-minute chart and the three-minute chart. And when everything's aligning and showing all the good symptoms on the three-minute chart, I wait for a little bottom to form and a reversal pattern. And, you know, it really helps. When you can break it down to two or three time frames, your, your accuracy can really be pinpointed. Okay. So in any one of these uh, um, techniques then, uh, what would be the frequency of trading that people might be looking at? Um, I... The index trades, like trading the SP 500, the Dow, or the NASDAQ, usually have about 30, 35 trades a year. So it's not an active system. It's, it's kind of, I call it casual investing. It's, um, we're just playing monthly waves in the market, and you know we're only getting a couple trades in, a few trades in a month, just catching these repeated waves, that, like patterns that happen in the market month after month. Some months we might not have any. The next month we could have, you know, five or six trades. It all depends on market conditions, but it's a casual investing style. Okay. And you don't do any then sectoral work independent of the broad index uh, to, to specifically look for sectors that would be in favor or out of favor? Um, once once, I, once the, the broad market has identified itself to be in, say, like a, a bull market, then you can just go out and you can start looking at, across the market to find the, the strongest sectors uh, within the market. And from there, you break it down to individual stocks. And you can go and cherry pick a couple that look like they've formed nice basing patterns or breaking out or they're in you know, a nice rally mode. They've had nice consolidation. And everything's looking good. Then we can go out and we do cherry pick these little plays. And I, I call them little rockets because we just go and we pick up you know, a small percentage of our portfolio of these little plays in these hot sectors within the bull market, and, you know, they can pop and rally 30, 40, 80 percent really quick. Good. So you've, uh, you've got four uh, readers of the book who want to uh, then take the next step. You've got uh, automated uh, trading processes that you provide and uh, newsletters, from my understanding. Yeah, so uh, what I've done is uh, over, over the years I've always traded the strategy. I've traded it for a long time, and I've decided a long time ago I wanted, I, my dream was, man, if this could be automated, 
I remember years and years ago, you know, everybody's talking about computers and wow, everybody was dreaming. Imagine automated trading systems. And of course, that popped into my head years ago, and it's been a lifelong dream. It's I want to I want to convert my strategy into an automated system and watch it trade, watch it trade my money. And uh, so that's what I've been working on for years, and really finished the system, made it available to my my clients, my followers. Uh, in February, and you know, we've had a great start so far. The system is uh, pounding away. We're making some some pretty good money. It's really exciting time. So, I've got this in, this casual investing strategy called Algo Trades. It just trades the SP 500 futures, and it trades automatically in our clients' accounts, so they don't have to do anything other than set it up once, and it runs and communicates with their brokerage account. Uh, so it's a it's a really exciting system, and uh, it's really. It's it's my dream machine, my dream robot, more or less that um, I get to now run and manage every day. Well, I mean, I guess the key to all of these things is that uh, you know it's it's a matter of upside capture versus downside, and as long as the uh, the trading systems are working, you you stay with them, uh, and uh, if the drawdowns are accessible and do not become uh, you know, prohibitively um, repetitive as far as uh, the poor trades are concerned, then the key here is that you have to, once you've done your homework and you've got a system, you have to stay with the system. You just, you, you can't deviate, and I think that's something that everybody has to understand. Uh, you know, have have some basic rules that you work from, and um uh, you know, I do. One thing I like about what you've put together here is that you do have a very limited number of things that you're looking at. I mean, there are, yeah. in terms of, you know, as a technician, you can be looking at more things than, you know, that you put ten technicians in a room, you're going to have eleven opinions. Um, and uh, but uh, with what you've got here, <laughs> it's, uh, we're going to end up with uh, some fairly well defined characteristics to it and uh, if for some reason things weren't working out uh, you know it wouldn't take you too long to see that uh, there's some deviation but uh, yeah it really comes down to simplicity right like you've got to make the market simple and as soon as you add something complicated in there people are just lazy it's easy to just be like "Mm, i'll do that later i don't need to do it or i don't want to do it whatever it's it's got to be really simple and straightforward and and through the through this book it really kind of walks you through this is kind of how I do things. This is kind of all my, my theory on how the market works and, and what I've applied to my trading and my trading systems. And when you when it's all said and done, you know, it, it either makes sense with you or it doesn't. In my opinion, obviously all this is just common sense. It's all this makes logical sense. And if it's logically makes sense, then, you know, it should pan out. So it comes down to money management after that, which is what the trading strategy does, it adjusts its trading strategies, its money management skill uh, sets, all these different things as the market volatility changes, the trend changes from an uptrend to a sideways chop. Um, so, yeah, and it's it's how quick do you recognize the changes, and that's uh, that's the key because it's uh, you're going to have those say drawdowns at the at the tail end of moves. If if it's a slow turn, uh, a rolling top or a rounding bottom, uh, you're going to get caught at the tail end, but. When you, you're making that good amount during the trending phases, that's that's what it's all about. So, well, uh, I do thank you for your time here today, uh, Chris. And yes, uh, I uh, would uh, suggest to people that uh, they go to your website. I believe at triple uh, w the technical traders dot com. Yep. And um, all the best in your book and with your service. After the break, Eric Coffin on this week in money. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Eric Coffin, editor of the Hard Rock Advisory Newsletter. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks for having me. In one of the last newsletters of yours that I read, people asked, are commodities dead as an active investment? Are commodities dead? I mean, it's hard to believe that, but I've read studies that say, yeah, they're going to slide in price, but does that mean they're dead as something to get into? Well, I mean, we're we're never going to stop using this stuff. Uh, I think the basic rationale behind the 
the super cycle. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people that most people assume that that whole thing is being debunked. I think that's a bit of a stretch personally. The, the, the so-called super cycle happened for, uh, for good reasons. I mean, essentially because they were, uh, they were, they were, uh, countries with large populations starting to move into, uh, a part of the economic cycle and, and average incomes where they started buying stuff. That's still happening. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at China, which of course is the 800 pound gorilla, yes, it's getting to the point now where they are and need to move to more of a service based economy, but you're still talking about an economy that's growing at 7% a year. It's not like their, it's not like their, their demand for any of this stuff is going to disappear. It's, it might grow slightly slower, but we also have to remember that there are, I hope, several other areas in the world that will also enter a similar growth phase over the next 10 or 20 years. And on top of all that, there's the supply side. I think in the short term, in some metals, you you may start seeing some surplus because after seven or eight years, they have managed to, to get production rates up in some metals. But by and large, you're not talking massive oversupply. And if you look at... Uh, if you look at, you know, let's take copper as an example. If you look at the copper mining sector over the last 20 or 30 years, it's gotten more and more difficult to find deposits. They're in more and more difficult places, and the average grade of the deposits being mined has, has dropped significantly. Uh, the same is true of gold. The same is true of most other base metals. And, you know, what that tells you at the end of the day, uh, a guy can be sitting in New York looking at a chart and saying, oh, well, you know, the chart tells me this, so that means that, you know, we're going to be buying copper in five years for a dollar a pound. Well, you're not going to be buying copper in five years for a dollar a pound because the mining sector isn't going to give you copper for a dollar a pound. That's simply not the way things are going when it comes to the, the costs involved. So I, I think you have to realize that if you're looking for a bottom on most metals, what you need to look at is what does it actually cost the mining sector to supply this stuff. I think the days of mining companies mining at a loss for years on end are are over. So I mean, you know, look at to look at the gold market as an example. The you know the all in sustaining cost for the gold sector is right about where the gold price is right now. Does that mean the gold price can't drop? No. I mean you're dealing with short term trading against long term supply. It could, you know, conceivable could drop a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks. Is it going to stay there for the long term? It's not as long as the demand is at these levels because the mining sector simply can't supply it at those prices. And the same is true of all other metals. Uh, I think a lot of metals, there's, there's a bit of room on the downside for copper, but probably not as much room as some people think. The, the average cost for most of these metals is a lot higher than people think. What about the fact that uh, a lot of Chinese uh, investors decided to back their loans by hoarding things like copper, and now that their loans are being called, they have to uh, sell their copper supplies? Does that mean prices will be down for a short term uh, because of this uh, oversupply, but then once that's gone, uh, we're going to see prices go up sharply? Well, we are we are getting two or three fairly large mines coming on stream over the next 12 months. So I, I think uh, my my base assumption is that we'll see a small supply surplus this year in copper, a larger surplus next year. It's not massive in relation to the entire uh, copper market, but it is it is definitely a surplus. But my bigger concern, main concern, really short term, is what you just mentioned, and that's that it's clear from a couple of recent price moves that there are entities, <laughs> uh, be they be they uh, Chinese banks or, or metal traders or whatever that have copper inventory that has been used as collateral. And we have, uh, pun intended, seen some collateral damage in the last month. And I don't think you can't discount that happening again. Uh, it, one of the things that I've, that's made me a little cautious on the copper price is I can't tell how much of that copper that's come out of the London warehouses is actually sitting as loan collateral. I don't think anyone can. Like, we just don't know. So I think you've got to assume, based on recent growth rates in China and everywhere else, I, I thought the drawdown in, in copper inventories 
seemed a bit suspiciously fast to me. So I think you got to assume some of that is sitting in non-bonded warehouses in China or somewhere else. It's not being counted by the London Metal Exchange, but it's still around. And the stuff in China in particular, I think you got to assume a bunch of that is also loan collateral. I mean, maybe the guys that took the loans out don't run into any problems and it isn't an issue and it just enters the market normally at some point down the road. But I think you've got to be cognizant of the fact that you could see another one of those, you know, 10 or 15 cent down days for copper because some guy gets a loan call. What about China's incessant drive to collect all the gold in the world? Is that still going on? It, it seems to be. You know, it's it's it was impressive uh, when they put out their February gold import numbers. Uh, I mean, all that we really get to go on is the, the gold that goes through Hong Kong because uh, the customs house there tracks it. Uh, the February 2014 import number for China was uh, 30% higher than January and 80% higher than February of last year. That's pretty impressive, actually, because <laughs> uh, it wasn't low last year. It wasn't until we got into March and April and the gold price really got whacked that the, the imports really rose in China. So I don't know if the comparables will be as striking as we move into, say, March and April. But based on the, only on the first two months of the year, it looks like this is going to be another record year for, for gold imports for China. And, of course, people watched the, the price last year take a huge plummet. I remember that black weekend uh, down $250, I think, on Friday, down another 250 on the Monday. Will China go and, and uh, offer up a lot of gold at some point to, to bring the price down so it's more affordable for them to buy more? I'm, I'm not sure they're as concerned about that. I mean, I, I think they're, they're price, there is price sensi- sensitivity to their buying, but I don't see them manipulating to that extent. I mean, is it possible that some of those gold imports are, are like the copper, for instance, held as loan collateral? They may well be, but, you know, short answer is I think we just don't know. But I think a lot of what's being imported there is people putting it aside as long-term savings, much as the Indians do. And that, that stuff, once it goes in, it doesn't come back out again. Uh, and, you know, if you look at last year's, Draw really the seller in the market last year was was of course the the Western ETFs North American ones mainly that was largely retail and hedge fund gold owners that had just basically ridden the momentum on the way up and when things turned they just bailed on mass and, and sold six or seven hundred tons uh, right now then I don't who knows whether the trend lasts but as of now that trend has actually reversed and the ETFs are uh, on a, in a small way, buyers, but but those kind of changes can have a big impact. And the reason why I I, I targeted fourteen hundred at the start of this year for gold was because I thought we'd probably see similar demand out of China and Asia, hopefully higher, but at least similar. And as long as we saw those ETF flows reverse, even if they don't get large in terms of inflows, that's that's a, that's a pretty big thing in the physical market. You're taking six hundred tons of supply out of the equation. To my mind, uh, you're going to get a higher price. What happens when India's economy picks up again? They are huge uh, nationally uh, gold bugs. I mean, individuals in India love gold. They need gold. They want gold. What happens when their economy picks up to the point where they can really go out and buy it again? I mean, there there has been a you know some would argue that what you really need to watch in in India is is how good or how bad the monsoons are in a given year uh, since. Certainly, a lot of the buying in, in India is rural. It is it is their base form of savings. But I, you know, in India, we've on on top of really, it wasn't so much economic issues in India as it was political ones. The uh, the politicians uh, increased the import duties three times and then effectively capped imports of gold because they said it was having too much of a negative impact on their balance of payments. Uh, you know, it, it probably was but it was having that impact on their balance of payments because the place is run by idiots and their financial system is, is a joke. And frankly, if you're, uh, you know, an Indian farmer that bought gold a year, a year ago or two years ago or five years ago, and you're looking at it in rupees terms, uh, you're, <laughs> you're the smart guy. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. And I, I don't think that demand, it's such a strong cultural thing. I don't see that going away. I think the big question mark is what happens as we get to the elections in India, which come in May, it looks right now, if you can believe the polls, like there 
will be a change in government. And uh, Modi, who's the prime ministerial candidate for the BMP that right now is way ahead in the polls, he seems to be much more uh, inclined to, to cut back on these import duties and, and scrap some of the restrictions. I mean, that's a politically popular thing to do. We have to see whether he actually does it if he gets elected. And it, it's also possible that the, the Congress party themselves will loosen the restrictions ahead of the election. You know, again, because it would be popular, because the Indians do love gold, they're not happy about these restrictions. That's really cut back on at least official Chinese imports for the last few months. So if that gets, if that gets rolled back so that India's buying goes back to the levels it was at, say, a year ago, and, you know, that, that's going to have a big impact because Chinese, uh, Indian imports have been quite small for the last few months because of these import duties and restrictions. If they, though they get normalized, that's a big positive impact on the gold market. I, I would think you would see, you'd probably see a big bump in the gold price just on that political decision. We'll have more with Eric Coffin next on This Week in Money. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're talking to Eric Coffin, editor of the Hard Rock Advisory Newsletter, Eric, what will happen if India and China's talks for common currency actually work out and they do come up with something to replace uh, the yuan and the rupee? I mean, I, I personally can't see, I, I, I can't, especially if I was Chinese, I can't see the argument for a, for a common currency. Uh, I, I think we're certainly going to see uh, a more liberalized, tradable currency in China I mean, they just doubled the trading ban on the yuan, and that's that's one of the steps in the process that, that's ultimately going to let the market determine where the yuan is going to trade. Uh, and and so I I think that itself can have some impact, given the given the changes in the leadership style. I guess not not to mention that you know the basic differences in the political systems. I'm I'm pretty skeptical you'd ever see a common currency between those two countries, like, like in China in particular. I don't see this how to their advantage. Uh, fiscally, they're much stronger than any is. I don't know. I, I don't know why they'd want to be doing that kind of a favor. Some people question why would Mexico be part of the North American Free Trade Agreement as well for the same reason. Yeah, well, you know, when you're if you're the, you know, if you're the lower wage supplier, having open access to the other economy is to your advantage. Uh, it would be, I you know, I think that sort of a system would probably be more advantageous to India than it would be to China. I could see why India might want to do it. I'm just not sure why China would want to do it. I've also heard, too, Chinese companies now, uh, even if they're government-owned, and most of them are, they just have a personal face up front. So we're used to dealing with uh, CEOs and so on, not government officials. But they want these companies now not just to look busy and to, to generate a lot of business for the sake of generating business. They now want them to go out and make a profit. Is that going to change the way they do business? I think it already, I think it already has for many of them. You know, one of the ongoing problems in China, and, and certainly the, it's not lost on the guys in Beijing, is that you do have a very powerful state-owned enterprise sector, and that's, that's right across all sectors in the Chinese economy. Certainly most of the largest banks in China are at least partially government-owned, if not completely government-owned. And one of the things that they know has to happen in the next few years is these, these entities have got to start actually operating as, as real economic entities where they, you know, they win or they lose. They have to make money. They can't expect to be uh, supported and have their overruns just covered by Beijing. I mean, I think part of the message in the latest five year plan was we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, you guys have got to get your act together. And I, I think the other part of the message is that you will see a little more uh, push to increase the size of the service sector. That's likely to be less government owned, just, just the nature of the service sector. It's much, it's much easier to set up small, you know, very large numbers of small companies, have them grow organically rather than have, you know, Beijing or build 25 steel mills or something. That, 
Uh, and what about all these cities that they've built for, you know, from between 400 and 600,000 people that are virtually empty right now? How are they going to populate them? And if they do populate them, is that going to be another big uh, boost to their economy? Well, I, I don't think there's any shortage of people to populate them. They've got to, they've got to give them something to do and they've got to let them move there. I mean, I, I think the whole, I think the empty city thing is probably a little bit overdone by guys that are, that, that are China bears. I mean, there are, you know, one of the worst parts of the, of the whole economy when it comes to malinvestment is sort of the cities and the provincial governments that are all competing with each other. Uh, part of the changes that are supposed to come in this five year plan is, well, two things. One is to loosen the residency requirements, basically make it a lot easier for uh, rural dwellers to move. And it's particularly to the, say, half million to two million person sized cities. They don't really want to have another 20 million people in Beijing. But <coughs> then they're also <coughs> starting to look at ways to actually privatize uh, land for the farmers because there's still a, it's a less collective system than it was, but in, in many parts of China, farmers still don't really have the type of individual title that allows them to collateralize a mortgage or, for that matter, sell their land. And probably the best way to enable that movement to happen to those small cities is to allow the farmers to do that so that if they want to move to the city, they can basically sell their land and that gives them the money they need to buy their place in the city. And that is a definitely part of this five-year plan. And that could, if it, if it works, that could, in fact, be another boost to the economy because this would be yet another wave of urbanization. Well, having everybody move to Beijing, we found out how that works. They have the worst air pollution in the world. It's reduced their life expectancy by about six years. And uh, anybody who's anybody who has money in Beijing is bailing out and trying to find some place where they and their families can breathe. So those new cities probably would have some pretty eager occupants. Well, and I, I think the, another another prong of the, I guess, the current plan and going forward, you're, you're getting to the point in China where you, you do have a fairly substantial middle class, and the middle class, by and large, have different aspirations and and different different things that are on the top of their mind than, say, a, you know, a slightly more than subsistence farmer. One of the things that's very much on the minds of the Chinese, and it's growing rapidly is there is, I, I think you'll see a big environmental movement in China because it's a, at an environmental level, a lot of these areas are just a disaster and it's something they have to deal with. And I, I think there's going to be a huge amount of pressure on the government to start cleaning these things up. And again, if you want to look at something in, a, in an indirect way that helps support some of the commodity prices and some of the non-Chinese producers, uh, I think you'll see much firmer crackdowns on illegal mining, and on some of the smaller operations that are just horrendous polluters over there. I think a lot of that stuff is just going to get shut down. And, and in fact, I know in the iron ore sector, there's already been talk of rationalization, which is basically Beijing speak for uh, we're going we're gonna to boot out a bunch of the little guys. Uh, the same thing's going to happen in the steel sector, in the smelter sector. They need to do that not just because too many of these things get built, but because a lot of the ones that get built are horrendous, are horrendous polluters. And I don't think your average Chinese guy on the street is going to put up with it any longer. China, perhaps uh, the perfect example then of, oh, well, to hell with the environment. We just want to make money with uh, huge industrial plants. And now they're finding out that's not such a good plan after all. Yeah, it's just. It's, it's, it's gotten out of control. I mean, there's, there's overinvestment in, in a lot of sectors in China. I mean, I'm not a China bear by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't disagree that there's a lot of sectors where there's got to be some, some pretty major rationalization has to happen. And a lot of these, a lot of these badly run, unprofitable, highly polluting operations, they got to close. <laughs> it's got to happen. And that leaves uh, the, the greener operations around the world uh, a bit of a leg up then because there will be a gap in supply. There will be a gap in supply, and I, I think it also just gives gives them a leg up because uh, you're going to see less, you know, less price advantage. I guess if you want to put it that way, uh, I don't think in many of these sectors, if they go forward, only licensing, you know, world class operations, and I mean that in terms of environmental impact and safety, <coughs> you know, 
it, it's more expensive to run that kind of operation. So I don't, I don't think the cost advantage that you saw 20 or 30 years ago in some mining sectors where China could just basically roll over everybody else. I think those days are over, and, and in large part, it's because the Chinese themselves realize they just can't keep operating that way. Eric, is there a website that people can go to to find out more about your views on how commodities are going to be affected by all these different world events? Yeah, if you go to my website, it's hraadvisory, one word, dot com. Uh, you can get access to some of the editorials that are right on the front page. I, I put reports up. Fairly often, there are often interviews with, with companies that I'm following, and uh, people can download those for free. And generally, within those will be uh, heavily discounted offers if they want to try chest driving the publications. Thanks to our guests, Chris Vermeulen, Ross Clark, and Eric Coffin, and thank you for listening. I'm Jim Goddard for Phil Mackesy. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.